Good morning, everybody. My name is Chris Davis from Model Office, and a warm welcome on this chilly morning to our first live RegTech webinar of 2019, all about the weird and wonderful world of the senior managers and certification regime. Um, I'm going to go through a few housekeeping points before I crack on into this. Um, first and foremost, hopefully, you um, can see your screen and uh, hopefully you can hear me. Now, if you can't hear me, um, then what you will need to do um, is phone that number. Now, what basically, if, if you can't hear me, you can, you can hopefully see what I'm doing here with my cursor. Turn on your audio and computer. If not, call this number. Um, but, um, it's looking like everybody is okay at the moment, and we've got a record attendance today, which is great. We've got a full house. Um, we've got half an hour, so I'm going to crack on um, and talk about the uh, the senior managers and certification regime itself. So the SMNCR, as it's known, um, is probably the most perfect, personally impactful pieces of regulation to hit. Uh, the retail financial services um, in decades. It um, is a new regime moving from the approved Persians regime, um, which aims to reduce harm to consumers and strengthen market integrity by making individuals far more accountable for their conduct and competence. It hopes to do this in two key ways, encouraging a culture of staff at levels taking personal responsibility for their actions, and as you can see from this slide, if you've read through it, obviously we can't have a finger pointing exercise in businesses where you know, it's their responsibility, not ours. Um, at the end of the day, it's all about high accountability and taking responsibility for um, our job roles in, in, in the environment which, which we work. And it's making sure firms and staff clearly understand and can demonstrate where responsibility lies. And this is really important because the shift is effectively moving away from the FCA, um, basically covering all the key issues um, and, and, and enforcing um, conduct rules uh, and certification rules and, 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 and the senior management rules to very much the firm. It's the firm's responsibility and then the individual's responsibility to show that they are highly accountable uh, and they have the right people in the right place with the right skills. Why the change? We've had, as I'm sure you're aware, so much going on in retail financial services. It's raining regulations, certainly since the financial crisis, mis-selling issues, uh, LIBOR issues. We've got the latest key issues surrounding pension transfers which is which is hitting the industry at this moment in time there's a high uh, focus from the fca on on conduct behavior on culture and on governance um we call the new um regime that we're in now is is the new accountability regime so it's all about increasing uh, and then showcasing high uh, accountability uh, within your businesses and your business organizations and departments and improving conduct standards throughout. But also, if you read the FCA business plan last year, and it will be cemented in this year's um, business plan, really the focus is, is on individual responsibility within the business. So effectively, what this means is that the senior managers in, in, in particular will lose the shirts off their back if things go wrong and if they're caught caught um, accountable for any breaches, for example, within the business. So if we take a look at the timeline that we have worked through on this, um, again, you know, an extended timeline, as you can see, uh, MIC's Treasury announces the SMNCR extended to all regulated firms in October 2015, and we're not actually going to get to that stage until everybody is regulated um, under this regime until the 9th of December this year. Um, so uh, last year they had a cement, it was all effectively cemented into the marketplace uh, with publishing the final rules um, and extending the rules to insurers in December um, last year, last month. Um, and also the new directory that the FCA has now uh, effectively published um, really will cover all the SMNCR 
um, and the senior managers within that new directory. So that is important. You get your head around the directory and how that works and and, and how that uh, how that plays out. But the key issue this year is the real focus for you in the business. You should be really focused on what you're doing really well, where potential weaknesses are, and as we'll see as we go through the session today, really putting together an implementation project um, across all those. Um, the, the key issues that we'll talk about. And the most important thing um, with, with this, it, it's all about project management. Um, and it's all about, you know, knowing, as I've said, who are the right people in the right uh, roles with the right skills. Um, we are producing five uh, papers on the SMNCR. I'll cover that at the end. Uh, but one of those papers will be covering this timeline issue. And that will be written uh, by an associate of ours, uh, Helen Clark at Mint Blue Consultancy. Uh, and that will really cover how you effectively can put together a project and tightly manage this on an ongoing basis. So really going on, again on the background of all this, um, the FCA produced this wonderful wheel, if you like, around key drivers for risk in a business. Um, and this really does apply to what we're talking about today. Uh, what they're asking you effectively to do is look at what, where the inherent risks are within the business, where there's asymmetry of information, uh, communication channels aren't working, any biases, any uh, rules of thumb and, and mental shortcuts that, you, that, that, that people are using to make decisions. So evidence-based practice is very, very important to, to weed out these issues. Um, there's, there's obviously um, key issues around it regarding the business itself, the structures and the business conduct itself, looking at the cultures, incentives, conflicts of interest and market structures. And finally, but not least, it's looking at the environment which you operate in, which is um, how you sit uh, and your understanding of the framework of the principles based regulations, um, looking at um, the technologies that you're applying to your business and obviously how you how you work within the economic and market arena. And the four factors at the top left there are very important because um, when we're looking at culture, you know, culture can be very, very hard to identify. It can be very hard to manage uh, and measure and manage. And so from that point of view, we've got to look at, you know, what the tone is at the top of the business because that tends to permeate throughout the business. We've got to also take a, a cross-sectional view of the business and look at why people are doing and what they're doing and what they're thinking. Uh, giving these people tangible goals which are aligned to the regime and looking at a firm's documented strategy and the mindset of individuals as they go forward. Because at the end of the day, what we are talking about here is a lot of the soft stuff, looking at the, the subconscious and the, uh, and the subsets that go with that, where we're effectively focusing on breaking down um, the way people are thinking on, on the job and their actions and behaviors. Um, so from that perspective, you know, social science tells us that we're, you know, in, as individuals, as human individual uh, decision making um, in, uh, agents, if you like, we have preferences, we have beliefs, we have habits, uh, we have behaviors and values. And, and, you know, the preferences drive the beliefs, which drive the habits, which drive the behaviors, which drive the values. So that could be effectively, you know, the preferences being influenced by emotions and psychological experiences within the business. Our beliefs are tend to can be uh, in the environment of uh, rules of thumb. You know, we've done this before, so we'll do it again. It's worked in the past. It will work again. Um, that can drive habits, which are shortcuts made on assessing information, which lead to the, the, the habits which are locked in. And then we get behaviors, which are actions based on beliefs and the habits, and then the values, which is the sense of honor and duty that we, we act upon. And, and some, in some um, respects, we will have to break this down by uh, the, the uh, SMNCR um, project plan to take a look at what exactly is going on underneath the bonnet in the culture and the conduct of the business, and then design the roles, responsibilities, actions, tasks accordingly as we move forward. One of the best ways to look at this is the uh, FCA produced back in April last year, they came out with their five conduct risk questions across, yes, it was across banks, but it does apply uh, to most retail financial service firms. I've just had a, a, a message in. If you're struggling on, um, I'm just going to send a quick message here. Um, um, please call in if you cannot hear, because we've had one person say that they're struggling on that. Um, so 
the, the five conduct questions really do look at getting at, to the nub of why people are doing what they're doing and, and, and also looking at you know, risk management and, 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 and making sure that, the, that we have a constructive culture and conduct within the business. And that's identifying the risks early. In this case, looking at roles, responsibilities, internal, internal communications, making sure you get informed consent from your staff, evidence is, you know, everything is evidenced, uh, making sure you have a breach policy, a risk register, um, and then looking at empowering individuals' accountability uh, to manage the business risk and conduct, uh, looking at mechanisms, mechanisms to improve risk management and conduct, digital tools, training and development processes, training and competency processes, what strategic oversight do you have, um, which could be investment committees, it could be boards, um, it could be templating your meetings, uh, making sure you've got agendas and so forth, and then assessing activities that can undermine good risk management, which could be remuneration procedures, complaints procedures, um, uh, and, and making sure that those risks are managed going forward. Um, what we also have is um, the, the the breakdown of the regime itself is important to understand within the business, because at the top of the pyramid, if you like, we have the senior managers, and they are all approved by the FCA. But the big shift with this um, overall regime is the second tier, which the certified um, regime and the staff encompassed by that. There's more people encompassed by this regime than APA before. Um, the key issue with this is that we have uh, the onus is on, as I've mentioned at the start of today, it's on the firms themselves. So that is really crucial to get in your heads um, and understand that it's up to you to make sure that you know who, who should be certified and who should be senior managers uh, and who should be under the conduct rules. Uh, and then you have systems and controls in place to ensure that each year, every year, these individuals are certified on an ongoing basis and the FCA is notified accordingly. Um, the, at the bottom of the pyramid, you'll see auxiliary staff. Now, the FCA has made it very clear that there are certain sets of staff who are not going to be covered by the rules. And the reason why that's important is, 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 is it's very important for you to understand who is covered by the rules. And auxiliary staff are are individuals such as you know receptionists or it could be security staff or you know HR admin people or whatever. Um, but it's very important that you know who they are because then you know who's going to be definitely covered within the regime. We also have a three-tier strategy regarding um, the regime, which looks at who's in scope, if you like, which firms are in scope. There's there's actually um, you know five tiers, but I'm just going to focus um, today on the three here, which really covers most of the firms that we deal with. Um, at model office, um, but you can see the limited scope firms are, are really looking at sole traders, limited permission consumer credit um, firms, for example, insurance intermediaries, these principal businesses, not insurance intermediation, um, and so forth. Uh, and the city, there's approximately 33,000 of those, of those uh, limited scope firms. We then move through to um, the in-between, as we call them, the firms in the middle, where there's about 14,000 firms, which actually is the majority of firms that we deal with. Um, and they, they're larger than the limited scope firms, but they're not quite enhanced firms. Um, and they've got, you know, a small number of mandated senior management functions, as we'll see in a minute, because all senior managers have functions um, and that they need to know and, and apply to their roles. Uh, and they may tran transition actually to enhanced firms as they grow as a business. And if we move through to the enhanced firms, there's about 350 of them at the moment. Um, and they are looking at, you know, anyone with assets under management higher than 50 billion or three, 30 million in annual revenue, 100 million per annum of consumer lending, non-mortgage um, lenders, um, et cetera, et cetera. So, so from that perspective, the important thing to, 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 to notify, note from this is that it's all fluid uh, and people can move between uh, those, those areas. And, and if you are, you know, large enough, for example, to move into the enhanced environment, then you need to understand how you're going to transition. Uh, between these firm types, these, these categorization types, it's very important. The other thing to mention as well, at a high level view, is there are a number of elements. There's actually 17 elements that apply across uh, the tiered, um, um, the, the tiered elements of, of who is covered, the categorization of the firms, and therefore um, the um, ASMCR elements, as you can see from the table here. Uh, cover a lot of key areas which you will need to get your head around. Now, we don't have time today to cover all these areas, but the good news is our guides will. 
Um, so at the end, when we come to the landing page, I'll show you how you can actually access those guides um, as, they, as they're published over the next few, few months. But the key issue to remember here is, is if you're a core firm, you're going to have, as you can see, quite a number of elements that you need to know and map and apply to your business. Um, and if you're an enhanced firm, then there are some more onerous elements like responsibility maps and handover procedures that you'll need to employ in your business. Um, let's move on to the three kind of key crux uh, strategies of, of the SMNCR. The first area is senior managers. And here we're looking at the senior managers are all SCA approved. Um, the, the idea here is that responsibilities of senior managers need to be clearly set out. Um, they are effectively in an area that they have the responsibility if something should, should go wrong, they can be personally held to account. Um, so there's a granular focus by the SCA on their actions. Um, and um, the second key area really in this is that they will have to um, apply and, and there will be a new document for them to complete around uh, what's called statements of responsibility. Um, and the purpose of a statement of responsibility is to make clear what a senior manager is responsible and accountable for. And so what we talk about here regarding model office is what we call ARCs, which is uh, effectively looking at um, to ensure responsibilities are clear and understood. And ARC stands for at their all actionable. Um, so they're identified, they're clear, they're accountable, they're, they're, and, and we know who's responsible for them. Um, the statement of responsibilities are reflective on the role, so they, they calibrate to the role, um, and they're clear, uh, they're clearly described, and most importantly, they're succinct. Um, so they only contain relevant information to that role. In other words, then there's, there's not an entire job description, a war and peace, if you like, around the role itself. The third area is, is taking reasonable steps, and this is really important when we talk about the conduct rules, as we'll see in a minute, but the reasonable steps are effectively ensuring that the senior managers have collective steps um, uh, and they're taken um, to ensure that um, activities and behaviours um, are, are meeting the new standards that they have to, 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 to meet. Um, the big key area with here, as, as, as is with any element of the senior managers regime, is all about fit and proper assessment. Um, but it's done at a more granular level than ever before, encompasses more staff than ever before, uh, and, and you will have reporting requirements around that that you need to know sooner rather than later. A broad role overview, just to give you an idea here of, um, of how this kind of fits. Um, well, what we're looking at here is, 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 is effectively looking at uh, three kind of types of, 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 of roles within the business. Um, and this is really focused on core or enhanced firms, but at the executive, if you've got an executive, you've got a board, you've got a C-suite, if you like, that's looking at the chief financial officers, the, the, the chief executives, and then the oversight functions. Well, you've got the chairman, the independent directors, you know, you've got NED, non-exec directors come into this as well now, which, which is, you know, a very important uh, move, because uh, I know a lot of financial advisory firms now employ NEDs, and quite rightly so, to give a more diverse board, but they will have responsibilities under the under this regime. Um, and then lines of defense and control, so there you've got compliance, the audit, the risk, uh, and technical roles such as anti-money laundering are all under there. And the this is, is looking at the core uh, tier categorization of firms and looks at the governing functions, uh, all giving, given specific names um, that you can see, SMF 1, 3, 27, et cetera. And the reason why this is in, in, important is, is that, you know, you really know, need to know about what the function name is and then what actually the responsibilities are with that particular function itself. So, for example, if you go down to the required functions at the bottom, you remember that we used to have a CF10 role or we have a CF10 role under the current regime, that's changing to SMF 16, compliance oversight, and then we've got the AML role, SMF 17. So again, this is important that you know this, you, you understand what the new descriptions are and, and the responsibilities are for the functions that, uh, that you'll need to apply to the business. And there's many more functions than this, 
um, particularly if you are a, an enhanced business, but, the, but it also does apply to some limited firms. For example, they may have a, an SMF9, a chair, uh, that they, they have it in the business, they, they will obviously need compliance oversight and, and AML uh, responsibilities. Let's move on now to the certification regime. So this, this regime um, is, is effectively um, a level below the SMR, the senior manager uh, regime. Uh, and really this is all about what we call, or what they call material risk takers. This is looking at individuals who have potentially a material impact on organizational risk and market risk. And the big key area with this, again, is fit and proper. It's all about showcasing competence, which is your knowledge in the particular roles that you, you exact in the business, and conduct, which is your behavior. And again, the important thing here is knowing the functions and knowing the descriptions and then you can map that out to ensure that individuals are doing the right thing at the right time with the right resources. So again, you know, this shifts the responsibility away from the FCA to the firm and to the individual, which is very important. So really what we're looking at here is ensuring that you know how you jump through the hoops on the annual certification uh, processes. Conduct is effectively um, looking at um, you know, the rules that replace APER principles and guidance. And the new conduct rules are clearly based on the previous rules um, for the individuals under the, um, under the approved persons regime, um, and also to a lesser extent, the principles for business aimed at firms. But the main difference between the new rules and APER is the greatly increased scope of the roles, um, uh, and it applies to, 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 to a lot more people within the business. So in other words, the, the, the litmus test is, do they have the knowledge to do their job correctly and behave in the right way? Um, that is kind of like crucial to get that right. Um, and, and really identifying conduct risk is important and deal with potential breaches. So ideally what you'll need to employ in the business now is, is, is a breach log, uh, a risk register uh, to understand you know, where the, the red lines are, if you like, uh, and ensure that everybody is 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 in 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 the boxes they need to be in. Um, uh, and if they're going to cross any lines, then then any delegation, any handover of responsibilities is handled accordingly. Uh, when we move through to the second tier, you can see here the SM one to four uh, in these roles. Um, one to three actually is all about reasonable steps which is in the rules, and that is ensuring senior managers have take collective steps to, and they've taken control of firm activities and behaviors, as, as I talked about earlier on. Um, but really what we're talking about here is, that, you know, for example, is making sure that they've got clear objectives, their training and competencies up to scratch. They have their, as I mentioned, compliance logs, breach logs, risk registers. Um, the, the handover and delegation procedures are, are clearly mapped and clearly followed. So knowing that the conduct rules is essential, knowing how they apply is essential, and knowing who they apply to is essential. Now, we, we have talked to a number of firms over the last year and a half or so regarding the SMCR. Our reg tech, our digital compliance platform, covers the SMCR. Um, and these are the key challenges that we found that a lot of firms are coming out with at this moment in time. It's really focusing on a gap analysis of how this works, of identifi identification and remediation of these gaps, who's responsible, who is a senior manager, how do we get the competency um, arrangements organized, and how does that align with the new rules. Um, we need to understand you know, a clear delineation of accountability regarding the senior managers, um, looking at um, you know, how do we demonstrate competency and how do new hires fill gaps. We, you need to look at the recruitment process within all this and, and, and how the roles and responsibilities are uh, marketed and communicated to new hires. Duty of responsibility, delegation of responsibilities, documented and overseen and need to keep additional records. Uh, and where those records are kept is important. So aligning this with uh, your back office or your practice management solution can be an important process to make sure that you've got the workflows, you've got the systems and controls to make sure evidence is ev you know, evidence is key to this. So evidence based practice, you, you know, not do you think this is true? Do you know this is true? Um, impact on HR process is important. Now, don't finger point to HR and say because it's, you know, a fairly HRE um, regime that's coming through, that it's your, their responsibility. No, it's a bit like the GDPR with 
IT. It's not the IT, just the IT responsibility. And in this case, really what you've got is a shift from, you know, HR um, be, being very people development process. It's also a very compliance um, process within HR now. So the, the appraisal processes are more rigorous. Um, legal risks need to be assessed. Training programs and competency programs need to be reassessed. And I've talked about recruitment there. An ongoing training certification is going to be crucial for, 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 for ensuring that the firm is, is going to be uh, sustainable within this new regime. Roles and responsibilities mapping um, can apply to enhanced businesses um, and, well, sorry, do apply to enhanced businesses, but can apply to core um, firms. But at the end of the day, it's, it's really good practice. It's good practice to put something together like this across the roles, across the responsibilities, the qualities of the individuals and, and time considerations and also resources uh, within the business. So this type of mapping is going to be uh, important to put into your into your plan. And also, uh, although this only applies to the enhanced categories, um, you know, looking at things like, uh, you know, mapping out responsibilities across the business, you know, reporting lines, allocation responsibilities, uh, and so forth is, is also going to be important. And we'd recommend anybody does this within their implementation project over the next uh, 10 months, 11 months or so. And believe you me, this is going to go quickly. So uh, when do you start this? Well, you know, we, we recommend you start ASAP. Um, this is an example of, of what we've put together for, for firms regarding their project mapping. Um, to take a look at you know what where to start, what to do, move away from overwhelm if you like, and move you know moving away from being a, a rabbit in the headlights to make sure that firms can chunk it down and break it down into manageable chunks. Um, avoiding tick boxes is very important. That point two there on the left. Um, this is a holistic um, you know regime that's coming through, uh, and what we want to ensure is firms are building a balanced scorecard across all the key areas. You've also got crossover with method two. Um, you know, there's the whole thing um, around information givers, which is an interesting one regarding MIFID 2 that came through and how information givers. So in other words, you know, if you're looking at that client responsibility um, function and the, the roles within that, well, information givers is all about giving and who gives information to clients. So that could be power planners. It could be client managers, um, uh, not necessarily just advisors or planners um, and wealth managers. So that is a key issue. And, and information givers will come under certification regime. So again, that's important to, to blend in against other rules and regulations and how this fits. Um, asking the right questions is key. And we, in the next slide, we'll cover that um, in brief for you. Um, clarifying reporting lines and so forth. So this gives you an overall view of, of how the project map can be put together. Key questions to ask, well, you know, there's a, there's a, you know, a plethora of questions that you can put together. In our papers, we cover this in far more depth. So there's no real need to take notes now. And, you know, this is recorded, so it will be put up on our RegTech channel and we'll send that out later for you. But again, it's important to be um, empowered with the right questions so that you're going to get the right information from the individuals in their roles and in their, you know, in their understanding of their responsibilities as they move across to the uh, new regime. So that's going to be important. And then putting together a transitioning plan and yeah, putting it into action is going to be important. So in other words, starting off with reviewing your readiness, making sure that you've got the team in place to get this in, into, into action and making sure that, you know, it's not, um, it's not railroaded at any stage, that it, it, it's a sustainable plan. Uh, and, and then and then basically implementing the plan then becomes uh, relatively easy because you, you've, you've, you've planned accordingly and you've, you've chunked it down, as we've talked about. So, again, this will all be in our papers um, that you can download on our, our on our website, which I'll send you the link for landing page if you want to if you want to gain more information on them. Um, Digital compliance is going to be important, and obviously this is the world that we're in. Um, and the reason why that's important, this is important because what digital compliance and digital business development tools can do is give you instant information on your business in real time straight away so you can get on with actionable strategies and resources. So in this particular case, this showcases the Your People key of our five keys in our system. You can see there highlighted the senior manager's regime um, at the bottom left. And uh, if firms click on that, depending on how they scored, then they are going to get 
a, uh, an action plan which cuts through the noise, gives them tiered tasks, and most importantly, resources and templates so that they can go away and then complete their project accordingly and keep moving forward uh, on an ongoing basis. Um, finally, but not least, uh, I'll finish on time today, um, which is always good news on a Friday. But the key area here is that we have a suite, um, we've built a suite of five guides which will be released over the next few months. Um, the URL is there, but you'll get a copy of that URL after this, um, this webinar so that you can um, show your interest if you're interested um, by clicking on, uh, putting your information on the right hand side, as you, as you can see, of the landing page here. Uh, and then what we will do is we'll add you to the list and then we will send out the guide to you when it's published. Um, and the, the guides will basically work, as I say, in a five tier strategy. So you will have um, an overview, which will give an umbrella view, if you like, of effectively what I've talked about, but far more granular, far more in depth. Um, you'll get templates with that about how to put together your project, what roles and responsibilities need to be mapped, um, uh, and how to report back to the FCA across the three key areas. Uh, the next paper after that will be about the senior manager regime. Then it will be certification regime and then the conduct rules. And then the, 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 the we'll also produce a paper uh, regarding how to run a project, as I mentioned earlier on. So I'm going to finish on time for you. Hopefully that hasn't blinded you um, regarding what needs to be done. It's a huge regime. It's got huge ramifications across the business. We'd recommend you get on with it ASAP um, and, and, get, uh, and get the team around it sooner rather than later. If you need any help and support, we are here. And again, I'll send out more details about how Model Office can help and our digital compliance and business development solution can help. Um, and um, don't be afraid to ask questions, however silly those questions you think may be. Um, there's no right or wrong on this. Just ask the right ask questions um, as you go uh, and to ensure that you, you're sense checking your process on an ongoing basis against this all-encompassing regime. So I'll finish there. Thank you so much for your time. I wish you a wonderful weekend ahead, and you'll be getting an email from me uh, very shortly with this information, as I've said, and also you'll get a further uh, email with the recorded session, uh, which will be allocated to our RegTech uh, webinar channel. All the best, and uh, hopefully we'll see you on our next one, uh, which will be in two weeks' time, when we will cover uh, the weird and wonderful world of Brexit. Thanks very much for your time.